So uh, we're talking about new discoveries in the Tarot. And I'm going to uh, divide this evening into three parts. One of which, is the first I'm going to give you a short history of the Tarot as it's known today. The second part will involve these new discoveries, um, which I have put together from a number of different sources. And the third section will be question and answer and discussion. So I would ask you to keep all of your questions and comments till then, because as a matter of fact, there's a lot of material here and um, it would be very hard to get through it uh, with too many um, detours. Well, as a friend of mine once pointed out, every book on the Tarot begins with the same title, same subject, same sentence rather. And it's this sentence. The origins of the Tarot are shrouded in mystery. Well, that's kind of true and it's kind of not true. I mean, a great deal more about it is known now than uh, was known say 100 years ago. And a lot of the more legendary ideas about it have been uh, dispelled. Um, so rather than talk about these legendary false ideas, I will talk about uh, what is actually known at this point. Now, the first thing you have to know on this whole subject is this. Playing cards came first. Now the Tarot is a deck of 78 cards. 56 of these cards are in four suits, just like regular playing cards. There's an extra court card called a knight in each suit. So that's 56 cards. The other 22 are variously known, are usually known these days as the major arcana. Uh, and these were added later. Playing cards came first. They were invented in China and came to the West through the Arabs. This is a 14th century picture, uh, rather a faded one of men playing cards. This is an illustration from a romance, a 14th century French romance in which the hero and his pals are, are cooped up by some wicked king or something or another and are playing uh, cards to amuse themselves. So those are cards, cards, not um, tarot cards. Um, well, how did these trumps or major arcana get to be added? Well, to understand that, you have to understand that there was a, a common thing at the time, and these were called triumphs. Sometimes there were parades in which there would be like a cart of certain symbolic entities following others, and they were supposed to have a mystical significance. Uh, here's one, uh, this is uh, an illustration of, a, of, and this is death. Um, and death is one of the key figures in these triumphs. Um, you will notice that there's certainly some resemblance to the devil, I'm sorry, the death card in the tarot because you have this uh, a grim reaper here who's just more or less a skeleton and lots of dead people and <coughs> chopped off heads here, which is um, one common feature of tarot uh, symbolism uh, of death. Um, here's another one, uh, another triumph of death. Uh, very much the same again with the same motifs. And here's, uh, a, Couplet about it, when that they look for not for me at all, with sudden stroke I make them down to fall. Now that is archaic English because it was translated by a man at the court of Henry VIII. Uh, and it's a translation of this long poem by the Italian poet Petrarch, which was called The Triumphs. And it's a series of poems that took him uh, over 30 years to write. Um, and he has his poems arranging in very little triumphs of one thing over another. Well, love, chastity in this view trumps love. Well, death trumps chastity. Well, fame, if you can get it, trumps death because you're, you'll still be alive, at least in a certain sense, after you die. Uh, of course, 
fame goes away too, so time trumps fame, and divinity trumps time. That's the structure of Petrarch's poem. And you can see a lot of these things, uh, love, death, time, reflected in one way or another uh, in the major arcana of the tarot, the 22 cards. Uh, in the 15th century in Italy, playing cards were modified to add these trumps, which come actually from triumphi. That's where our word comes from. Um, and these were added, uh, and they looked, here are some early examples. Um, these are from the late 15th century, these are Italian. You can, in those who are familiar with the tarot will see, well, this is the hermit, you know, the, the old man with a lamp. Uh, here is the moon, uh, not quite the same as, as the one in the tarot deck. Here is the lovers, uh, these pairs of lovers with Cupid uh, shooting down uh, from above. So this kind of iconography, uh, yeah, here's death. Um, this kind of iconography was already for pretty firmly in place by around the year 1500. Now, another thing you need to recognize about this is that the, the tarot was a game, that it was a, a card game. It was, in fact, there were a lot of different games you could play with the tarot, just like playing cards. Uh, there is no evidence that they were used for fortune telling until the 18th century. In fact, there was no evidence that anything, uh, any cards were used for fortune telling until the 18th century. The first reference to it in literature is, uh, strangely enough, in the memoirs of Casanova. Casanova, when he was in Russia, bought a Russian surf girl. You could buy surfs in those days. Um, and he sort of kept her around, and he, he was pretty fond of her, except she had one very bad trait, which was that she was compulsively jealous, which is not perhaps an ideal characteristic to have if you're Casanova's girlfriend. <laughs> In any case, he kept saying she would compulsively uh, use these playing cards to kind of tell his whereabouts and that kind of thing. So that's the first reference to it that we have in this really odd context. Uh, and no one had any particular association of it with esotericism, uh, with ideas, even though a lot of these ideas came from the, the kind of, in a sense, the, the medieval tradition. It was still just thought of as a game. Then, in the year 1770, this man, this rather glum looking man, Antoine Cour de Jeblin, published a book called Le Monde Primitif, the primitive world, in which he said this. I'm not going to read it all to you, but uh, it's a work of the ancient Egyptians, a book that contained their purest doctrine, and that this fruit of exquisite wisdom as an insignificant pile of extravagant trumps. So Coeur de Jeblin in 1770 was the first man who said that there is an esoteric significance to the Tarot. That is the first instance we have of that. So it was much, you know, the tarot was invented, say, I don't know, 1440 or something like 30 or, 30 or 40. That's 300 years before anyone decided to say it was, um, had any esoteric import. Uh, and this is a common theme that this is a work of the ancient Egyptians. Uh, now, one thing you have to know is that there is uh, nothing in ancient Egyptian art that looks like the tarot in any definable or obvious way. There may be something else behind it, and that's what we'll get to, but uh, there's no tarot deck you know, to be found among the tombs of the pharaohs. The, the next important figure in the history of this whole concept was this man, another Frenchman, Eliphaz Lévy, who was one of the most influential occultists of his time, which was the mid 19th century. Uh, he was an extremely important figure. And in one of his books, he wrote this. 
The 22 keys of the Torah, that is the major arcana, the trumps, are the 22 letters of the Kabbalistic primordial alphabet. So Eliphaz Levi is saying that the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which were often considered uh, the Kabbalists, the mystics of Judaism, would often meditate and, and permute um, these um, letters uh, as a form of mystical contemplation. These letters were somehow related to the 22 major trumps of the Torah. Well, what did he mean by that? Well, let's begin by actually looking at the, this is the earliest alphabet. Um, this is, was invented by the Canaanites and the Phoenicians, uh, some, you know, sometimes between 15 and 1200 BC at the end of the Bronze Age. If you count those squares, which ha each one has a letter, you will count 22. This, uh, this was the first alphabet ever uh, devised. Uh, it is the ancestor of just about every alphabet now known in the world, including our own. I mean, you can even see our alphabet here. Well, guess what? This I in here is the ancestor of the letter O. This Lamed here is the an ancestor of our, our um, letter L. Uh, Aleph, well, this just likes, looks like an A on its side. So this is where we got our alphabet, and this is how it came. Here are some hieroglyphics, which the Egyptian writing. Now, in Canaan, Canaan and Phoenicia, now known as Palestine and Lebanon, and Israel and Lebanon, um, they simplified it so that each of these hieroglyphic symbols was correlated with a sound. Usually, it would be uh, the, the, the first sound of the thing that you were drawing. Like this uh, looks like waves, and it's water, and uh, it is the letter M, which in Hebrew is Mayim. Uh, ayin is the word for I. Uh, uh, this is a head, which ended up evolving into our letter R via the Greek. Um, this. This T became this T. Um, that's where it happened. It came, it came from the Phoenicians through the Greeks to the Romans. And that is our alphabet. Which we still call it the Roman alphabet. Um, I'm going to go back a minute to this. Because in between the old Phoenician, in between these letters, this is what the Hebrews wrote in in the time um, of the monarchy of Israel between um, 1000 and 586 BC. These are the letters they use. If they dig up anything like a potsherd or something else with something scratched in it, uh, those are the letters you will see. They did not use or have this. There were these Aramaic letters. This is the Aramaic alphabet. They, the Hebrews and the Talmud called it the Assyrian alphabet. So guess who they got it from? Um, you'll see this looks more, this look, starting to look more like Hebrew letters. Um, and um, hence, we have this. In the Talmud, it says that, um, the, the Talmud calls these old letters br the broken letters, because they are actually kind of crude. And uh, one place in the Talmud, it says that uh, the law was given um, in these broken letters um, because the people were degenerate and they were slaves. And only after we became refined did we start to use this uh, nice, lovely alphabet that we have. So the whole point of this is that these 22 letters evolved through a couple of steps into the Hebrew alphabet. Right? That all pretty clear? Um, and again, these are 22 letters. This is another set of 22 letters. Uh, 
So why 22 letters? Obviously, Eliphaz Levi and the Kabbalists um, insisted on the importance of these, uh, this number. Um, and that is kind of where we're getting into the new stuff. A lot of what I'm putting together from now on is kind of from the French esoteric tradition because the tarot was, was a part of the French esoteric tradition. The tarot was virtually unknown in the English-speaking world until the 20th century. Uh, but it was very much studied among French occult circles. And not a lot of this knowledge has, has come across, even though England and France are you know, pretty much next to each other. Well, let me answer, ask, let me answer this question with a question. How many regular polygons can be inscribed in a circle? What do I mean by that? Well, here's a circle, and this is a regular polygon. That's to say all the sides are even. And that's one regular polygon, the triangle. So that's one. Here's another. This is, again, a square, a regular polygon, and it can be inscribed in a circle. So how many of these figures are there? Would anyone like to make a wild guess? 22, precisely. And this is how they go. Here, these are the numbers. The Roman numerals are the numbers of the figures. Uh, these are the number of sides to the figure. Triangle, square, pentagon, um, hexagon, octagon, uh, nonagon, decagon, do dodecagon, and beyond this here, I suppose this is the icosagon. Beyond these, like, there aren't even names for these because no one, you know, where do you ever see a 40-sided figure? But these are mathematically uh, possible. Uh, and incidentally, this is why the circle is divided to 360 degrees. An otherwise mysterious thing. Why, why not? Now, um, and that's all well and good, but so what? What do these have to do with the letters? What do these have to do with the tarot trumps? Well, in, in the esoteric tradition, each of these figures has an esoteric name. I'm talking about the, geog ge um, the uh, geometric symbols at this point. Number three is the queen of heaven, the prince of this world, word, letter, perpetual vibration. Time. And again, you can start to, see, you can start to see the old triumphs, you know, making their way in. So, these are the esoteric names of the figures, and how do they all fit together? Well, let's take this one. This is the first one, the triangle. Love, affirmation, imperceptible light. Uh, the Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, so we put it with that, and let's put something else on with it. Let's put a, this figure on with it. Oh, you know, th it's kind of weird because if you look at this, this figure almost is kind of shaped like an Aleph. And you will see almost echoes of these letters in some of the uh, tarot images. Now, this is the tarot of Marseille. Um, which, again, is more popular in France than it's, it's been in the English-speaking world. Uh, in the English-speaking world, tarot aficionados are uh, kind of rediscovering uh, the tarot of Marseille on the grounds that it's um, a, a more authentic, more, as some would say, archetypal than um, some of the newer ones uh, that you may be familiar with. Um, in any case, I think the Tarot of Marseille is, is, if nothing else, gonna tell us a little bit more about the background and history of the Tarot. So there's a process, you know, this is number one. This is a process of initiation, the magician. And again, you see the, the um, Aleph. Here's number two, the square. 
And, you know, it's kind of a squarish composition here, apart from the fact that it's a, the card is rectangular to begin with. Word, logos. Um, that says <laughs> the papis. And in the old decks, uh, this was called basically the lady, the female pope, or sometimes Pope Joan. There was, in fact, actually probably a real woman who somehow got herself made pope and, and wasn't found out until two or three years after which um, they treated her in a very unkind way indeed. Uh, so there's probably some truth to this, but it's also kind of a, a hieratic figure. Um, in a way, I, I, well, in a way, it sometimes feels as if it's a little bit, um, this, is, this is one of the ones that have some reason or another an Egyptian feel. The other thing about it is that this is a weird thing to have in a Christian context because there never was supposed to be a female pope. Um, and why it's there uh, is a little difficult to explain, except in the context of what I'm telling you about. Here's, well, this is the queen of heaven, the empress. Now, the queen of heaven is kind of an interesting figure in herself. Um, um, queen of heaven cemetery, uh, where uh, a friend of some of us was interred a couple of weeks ago, uh, um, Marvin Young. It's a Catholic cemetery dedicated to the queen of heaven. Well, then you look in the book of Jeremiah and the Jeremiah starts railing at the Hebrews uh, for worshiping the queen of heaven in their temple. He says, you know, you had your temple thrown down and sacked because you were worshiping the queen of heaven. The people said, no, that's not what happened. We were worshiping the queen of heaven. Everything was fine. It's so when you people threw the queen of heaven out of the temple that they came and destroyed, the Babylonians came and destroyed everything. And this is actually in the book of Jeremiah. So, but today, we, uh, you know, in the Catholic tradition, have brought back the Queen of Heaven, and she's known as Mary, of course. Uh, it's one of Mary's almost countless titles. But here she's the Empress. Now, let's look at this one. The Emperor, the Prince of this world. I mean, those are pretty, those are pretty close concepts. Um, the prince of this world sometimes uh, is, well, sometimes the, uh, the devil is referred to as the prince of this world, although not in this particular system. The uh, Pentagon here, uh, the third figure. Um, this is an aside, but if any of you have heard of the concept of gematria, gematria is a Hebrew version of numerology. If you add the, the, it's very famous uh, in the Kabbalah. You, these letters are numbers. And if you add up certain, the numbers of the letters and, and uh, the numbers of the uh, letters of a certain other word, they suggest a kind of equivalency. Most gematria link the numbers with the letters this way. Daleth is the fourth letter of the alphabet, so its, its value is four. There is an esoteric numerology, very little known. I've never seen anything written about it in English, which has a different system of numeration. The value of this letter is not this number, but the number of sides to this figure. So you would add if you're adding things up, this would be a six rather than a four. And that would yield lots of different results. That is, that is I, I've never even seen anyone write about this in English. Well, here's kind of a funny one. Le Pape, the Pope, Pope. Uh, and you see him uh, associated with nutrition. Well, perhaps a little bit uh, of a stretch. But of course, there is the word pastor, which comes from the Latin pascare, meaning to feed. So in a sense, the ecclesiastical authority is sort of the person who provides spiritual food to, uh, 
the faithful. Makes sense, doesn't it? Rebirth, renewal, the lover. Is this the lovers or the lover? Lover. Um, a lot of the modern tarot decks call, say, call it the lovers, but it's, in a sense, it's, it's about this guy. And Cupid is shooting kind of right between him and obviously his, what we're supposed to think is his soulmate and this rather unpleasant person is getting in the way for reasons that are not quite clear. Living matter, chariot. The symbolism of this uh, probably goes back to um, a dialogue called the Phaedrus of Plato, in which he likens a soul to um, a chariot drawn by two horses, one a very good quality and the other quite the opposite. Basically, the good and evil impulses in us. And um, there's certainly some echo of that in this. Letter, hermit. Here's another fairly obvious one, life perpetual vibration. This is probably, if you were you know, writing, drawing something in a late uh, medieval context, um, that's probably as good a way as you're gonna uh, depict perpetual vibration, is the wheel going round and round and round. Esoterically, of course, um, this is often seen as the descent into matter, this kind of humanoid figure is kind of descending down, and this animal-like figure is kind of coming up. So it, with this um, kind of with the sphinx presiding over the whole show, a wheel of fortune. Justice, search, progress. Notice kind of a visual echo of this letter, the cough with this. Tension. That is Lamed, an L, which is a goad. That is the hanged man. He's certainly one of the most mysterious cards. Um, the hang, to be hanged upside down meant one, one thing in those days, and it still does in certain parts of the world, like Italy. Uh, if you hanged somebody upside down, uh, it meant he was a traitor. That is what it means. Uh, some of you may have even seen a photo from the end of the Second World War when these Italian partisans finally caught up with Mussolini and shot him and his mistress and, he, and they hung them upside down. And there's a picture of this and you can easily find it on the internet, I'm sure. Why? Because it, these partisans considered, you know, the rather, uh, well, they considered Mussolini to be somewhat a traitor to the nation, which is sort of way he was. And there are more dimensions of this. Like this is a, a word that is lamed whose original kind of ideogrammatic reading was uh, a goad, you know, kind of thing you poke animals with. And it um, later came to be learning. And so attention is really actually not a bad correlation with this. What does it have to do with the hanged man? Well, that I don't know, but there is another interpretation of this. Um, that some esotericists will say the fact that this figure is reversed shows a change in orientation. That is to say, in a sense, you're, you're, you're standing on heaven now rather than on earth, right? Your, your, your orientation is this way, not that way. And it's a common theme in esoteric teaching that, you know, if you really are on the path, in a way, uh, people are gonna sort of look at you as a traitor. 
you know, like, why aren't you like us anymore? And this can take strange forms, and as the uh, good book says, a man's enemies shall, shall be those of his own household, which often enough proves true. And that's, you can't get much more closer than that. Um, all of these cards, by the way, are from the Tarot of Marseille, but there are different versions of the Tarot of Marseille. I just found this, this is a particularly weird and um, disturbing one, which seems to be a good choice for death. But now you can look back and you see, well, you had all those severed heads, you had the sickle, the scythe rather. Um, it goes right back to that um, late medieval symbolism of the triumphs. Time. What, well, the French word for time is temps, T-E-M-P-S, and this is temperance. So again, it's a, it's a fairly close uh, contact. Now, the other thing about all of these is that they are symbols. And when I'm talking about a symbol in this context, I, I'm meaning something like this. A symbol means itself, so to speak. It, um, it means itself. It is what it is. And you encounter the symbol directly by contemplating it, whether it's a tarot card or a Hebrew letter or a geometric form. And it means that. But Subsequently, meaning becomes attached to it. Meaning is kind of like, there's the symbol and then meaning, and it can have lots of different meanings in different contexts. One of the most powerful symbols of all time is the swastika, which until around 1933 uh, was universally regarded as a good luck sign, believe it or not. Um, it's a very powerful symbol, but it, uh, it was distorted and now it's, you know, uh, everyone would pretty much would look at a swastika and consider it um, you know, more or less synonymous with evil. At least most people would. Well, here we've got the devil. Thought, calculation, lie, illusion. It's a rather... Uh, these designs are odd, and one never really knows kind of what to make of them. Um, it's as if their crudeness is part of their way of expressing what they have to express. Like, for example, this devil is, is not particular. I mean, he has all the claws and, you know, this and that. Um, but the devil actually looks kind of stupid. And he, you know, he'll, well, I guess lie, you know, uh, illusion. Um, and, you know, maybe there's an idea in that. Maybe the, the idea is that um, <laughs> number, the person, number one person you're most likely to fool is, um, guess who? Yourself. It's easier to lie to one person than it is to many people, even if that one person is yourself. I would say this uh, explains a great deal about even ordinary psychology. Relief so in a sense, this is kind of clearing the board so things start all over again. Um, it's certainly kind of a, it's certainly a powerful card. Uh, in the English decks, it's called the Tower. This is it's a rather curious name here, La Maison Dieu. It's I mean it's not even really grammatically French. It means like the House God. The house, God, there's no de or of in there. And they, they could certainly have fitted in if they wanted it to. So that may have some significance. But again, you know, it, it, this is not quite as negative as it looks, because it does look like some um, uh, energy is coming down in the form of these sparks. And um, you know, it's certain, the most obvious image it, it really suggests is, um, you know, the, false, the fall of false gods. This letter, the Hebrew ayin, 
the chu uh, already saw as the source of our letter O means I. So in a sense, if this had to do with self-deception, maybe this has to do with realizing the awful truth, whatever that may happen to be. Appeal, call. When I was looking, at, looking this up on the internet, I came across some site that said, um, this is one of the most magnetic cards of the uh, tarot. And in a way it is. Appeal, in this sense, um, means as in sex appeal, you know, an appeal, someone has appeal uh, as much as, as it is a call in the more um, literal sense. Fixation, waiting. There is something kind of weirdly stagnant about this. Um, many tarot aficionados associate um, the cards with the planets and also the signs of the zodiac. Uh, so if so, this would make it look an awful lot like Cancer the Crab, ruled by the moon. I mean, astrologically, uh, the sign of Cancer is ruled by the moon. So there's an, that, that is another, um, shall we say, um, layer of symbols that could be worked into this. And again, you're not really trying with all of this to come down and say, you know, there's like this fixed meaning X, Y, and Z. It's rather a thing that has a lot of meanings that branch out from it, which may not look like each other, but it would probably be a mistake to say that they contradict each other. And that would be true of astrology. I mean, you could do, you know, a, a certain people certainly have done lectures on astrological symbolism from very much that point of view. Reintegration, this certainly one of the more innocent and cheery cards. Sun. That letter cough is the ancestor of our letter Q. That means the back of the head. It probably has some reference to um, the primitive brain, the back of, you know, the medulla and, you know, the kind of the more, the more primal levels of the brain, which are at the back of the head, rather than this is the front of the head. So in a sense, it's like awakening. Um, and notice, I mean, all of these are Christian symbols, kind of. They're kind of Christian symbols, but they're also kind of not Christian symbols. Um, you know, the, this image is certainly, you know, familiar from, you know, any number of, uh, you know, Christian sacred uh, writings and um, images but you somehow get the, the sense it means something different here. Again, my whole point is that there's not one thing, but maybe many different things. And your reason for studying this is to be able to, you use this so you, you're able to integrate a lot of related ideas. So your mind itself becomes more integrated and unified. That arguably is the reason for studying sacred symbols rather than just um, having it be like, um, you know, knowing this for the sake of trivia or something. Pause, the point, the monde, the world, hermaphrodite figure. These are the four beasts of Ezekiel, uh, of the, the Ezekiel's vision in chapter one. The man, the eagle, the ox, and uh, the, uh, the lion. Uh, and, you know, people uh, who are familiar with astrology will uh, recognize these as the four fixed signs of the zodiac. This is Aquarius, who's a human, 
Um, Scorpio is the eagle. Scor this is an alternative symbol for Scorpio. Uh, Taurus, the bull, and Leo, the lion, the four fixed signs of the zodiac. And this is the hole. The fool. The letter tau or t. Now you'll notice that I put this circle back in here. Um, I, I did not um, really feel like drawing 48-sided um, um, geometric shapes or anything like that, so I left most of them out. But if you will remember, go back to this. Look down here. This is card 22. Let us say this is the, the fool, although it's not numbered. Now this is associated with a 360 degree polygon for which there's no ordinary name because you never see such a thing. It, the, this is the, the degree of its angles. Well, a 360 sided polygon, it's kind of hard to imagine. And it could fool you into thinking it's a circle. So maybe that's one of the meanings of this fool, that it would be associated with this 360 decided figure. There's maybe one, one of these uh, images, these um, uh, meanings of this. Um, now you can see there are enormous numbers of different um, symbols within the symbol, like this you know, some people have, uh, some tarots are kind of the more modern, um, you know, um, sugary ones have, have, you know, this is kind of like a little dog jumping beside the fool, but you know, this obviously looks like, <laughs> if you just take it as only, it looks like this, this basically this bum who's being attacked by, you know, somebody's dog who wants to drive him out of the house, and it's probably closer to what it is. And, you know, of course, the fool at some level represents all of us. So, where do we come from? Here, here are the forms of the Hebrew, 22 Hebrew letters. And it, they can be traced in a funny way to these hieroglyphs. So when they say it has an Egyptian origin, this could be at least the source of this idea. To be more specific, Okay, you know, you, oh, you know what? Um, you know all that stuff about Moses and the Exodus and the Red Sea and stuff like that? That couldn't have happened. That was historically impossible. Do you know why? Because the Promised Land was an Egyptian province at that time. It would be like saying you led the, the, the children of Israel out of the United States into Alaska. So, and the Egyptians ruled Palestine, as it came to be called, came to be ruled um, Canaan, and they weren't quite as far up as Phoenicia, but it's conceivable that in this milieu, someone, some esoteric school about which we know nothing, started with these Egyptian hieroglyphics, made a set of letters, uh, which eventually they numbered at 22 for the reasons we've just been talking about for the last half hour. And that could be why the tarot is said to have an Egyptian origin. Now what I'm saying is speculative. Uh, and when I say it's speculative, it means, um, from my point of view, it's, it's consistent with known evidence, but you would have to have a lot more evidence to prove that it was so. Uh, I have no particular reason to believe this evidence will ever show up, although it could. Um, so, you know, maybe there was some truth to this Egyptian idea, at least in this very indirect form. Uh, before Eliphaz Levi, nobody equated the Hebrew letters uh, with the um, 22 tarot trumps. This is not to say that Eliphaz Levi made it up or discovered it, because with these things, you, and particularly in this sort of line, you have to at least consider the possibility 
that these things were transmitted secretly and then just at some point or another someone decided to make them public. The Western esoteric traditions have been obsessed uh, with secrecy. Why? Um, because um, they were persecuted. Um, it was, you know, it was up, up until the Reformation, uh, doing anything in Europe that would threaten Catholic doctrine could, could and often did get you burned at the stake. After the Reformation, things loosened up a bit, but then all these, uh, you know, scientific geniuses came in and, and started laughing at all this esoteric stuff, which they all thought was nonsense. So, um, you know, even today, this, these ideas are not um, forbidden. I was sort of discussing them in public. Uh, but from the point of view of the mainstream intelligentsia, they're certainly ridiculed and not, and not taken seriously. So the Western esoteric traditions always had a certain motivation to um, hide themselves and only emerge when it was safe to do so. So that's kind of a lot, but you know, uh, to go back to it, it's, there does seem to be s some connection between the symbolism of these figures, the names for them, the tarot cards, and the Hebrew letters. All of which, number 22. Some of the tarot cards I'm familiar with, you know, they have a picture and then the explanation of the, the term in, in, a, in a verbiage. Um, and that way you pull the card and then it will kind of give a insight to the current problem you're seeking for. This is the very original, so I, I don't know, it might not have, but is that a turret has a, a word and an explanation normally? It might not necessarily be a tarot card. There are a lot of um, decks and fortune telling cards that range all over the place. Um, a lot of them are simply inspirational. There'll be like a, a deck of cards that, you know, um, you know, you pull it out and says, you know, this is the first day of the rest of your life or whatever. Um, this, you hope, has some meaning for you in the context that you're asking it. So there are a lot of different uh, versions of it. Um, I, the tarot cards themselves, generally speaking, anything that's kind of properly a tarot card is um, probably doesn't have too much, much more verbiage on it than this. And the old ones, you know, like the old Italian ones. Um, uh, you know, these, these are kind of the original ones. You can see, I mean, they, don't, they, they didn't have any explanations at all. So where did the trumps come from? They seem to be like uh, metaphysical or philosophical ideas that, uh, I mean, were they the first set of cards? No, they, the playing cards came first, and then the, where did the trumps come from? Well, they came from um, this concept of these triumphs. And they were parades. Like they would have carts where a person would, you know, would be dressed up as death and swing a sickle. And the next one would be whatever came after it, like, you know, lovers. Um, so that, and then these evolved into these symbols. They made them into cards. And probably there was some esoteric school in northern Italy that um, took these symbols, which were around at the time, and possibly worked their knowledge of sacred geometry into it. That is possible. First time visitor, long time tarot fan, love it. So we know like the, the early, early decks, like these we know were wedding presents between Italian families. Sometimes. So like, so like, the, like we typically have like the Visconti family, like with the Visconti spores at decks. Um, and so we know that they, were, that they had painted their daughters and their sons and stuff into this. And so the first, and in that society, None of these cards were stagnant. Like we have the deck that has all the, Ro all the Roman gods. We have most of the decks at this time have only about like 12 to 16 triumphy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we really don't see the influx of the Neoplatonic influence until about 100 years later. The Rosenwald sheets are like the, only, the first 
sheets in a Marseille style, that woodcut style that we can actually see that has. So I'm just kind of curious as to like where did the leap come from, from there being kind of like family and court games depicting like uh, a lot of people have a the theory that they they depict scenes from um, the Divine Comedy. We can see we're in like in the in the Tower card. It depicts a very famous fable about faith at the time. So how do those link up with with a secret society? I'm just, I'm just kind of curious as to how that all kind of comes together. Yeah, I mean the thing about it is if it's a real secret society, guess what? You've never heard of it. I mean, all of the secret societies you read about, these either were never secret societies or secret societies that for one reason or another decided to go public. A secret society is a secret society, right? Um, you don't know it exists. Does that make sense as a hypothesis? So where, you know, it, when it came, I mean, yeah, this is probably loosely, this was a loose, tradition uh, in the 15th century. At some point, it became uh, kind of fixed in the system of 22 trumps that, you know, we have. Uh, they, they finished off because at that point, people are talking about oh, it's missing prudence because mm -hmm. if you go to the, like the four hopes, and then they also included the zodiac signs at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts? Like, is that just another, because that was going on at the same time, is that just kind of another form, why did that not progress forward? Because it seems like it should with the zodiacal signs and uh, the elementals. They were all within the deck at that point. Yeah, I mean, my impression is that a lot of those more complicated uh, versions were somewhat later than these, or they were kind of one-offs where, uh, you know, a particular deck is made Hey, let's throw in the, uh, the zodiac signs. Hey, let's throw in the planets. But it never really quite caught on. Um, now, you know, the thing is that this is obviously fairly, going to be fairly fluid because no one has a copyright on this. So you can kind of do anything you want. As you, as you say, um, these, were, these would be very expensive to produce, right? These are all hand painted. Uh, and. You know, if this really is gilding, which it may well be, it would be that much more expensive still. My question is along similar lines. What is your understanding as to why the producers of the Tarot of Marseille settled on 22 trump cards and not another number? For as you're probably aware, the predecessor decks of the Tarot, the Italian Taracco decks, in some cases had more than 22 trumps and they were not numbered. I mean, they, they, why 22? Well, um, uh, because it represented this kind of collection of sacred symbols. And someone put these together with, who we don't know who, with these ideas, uh, names out of the esoteric tradition and, and drew them in picture form. I mean, the thing about a, a geometric shape is that it can be used as a symbol of contemplation. That is, you kind of meditate on this symbol. And um, if you do, a lot of things are likely to come up. If you were a working esoteric group, you, what would you do? Well, you would sit around, you would all meditate on this symbol, and then everyone would say, well, this is what occurs to me, this is what occurs to me, this is what occurs to me, this is what occurs to me. Somebody would write it down and it, they would see similarities and, and boil it down to uh, what seemed to be the essence of it all. And uh, if it seemed like a, a good workable system, um, they carried it on and perpetuated it. And in this, you know, they would perpetuate it in, you know, a very um, apparently innocuous form uh, of just card games. Hi, um, every book that I've purchased and every deck that I purchased of tarot cards has a section that describes different spreads. Is there a significance in which spread you choose to find different information or can you kind of guide me through that? Yeah, um, well there are a lot of different spreads. Um, and the simplest is the three card spread, 
which is you put three cards down, past, present, and future. That's the simplest. Um, probably the best known or most widely used by a lot of people, it's what's called the Celtic cross. Uh, so you put these cards out in a cross and then you put four others uh, on the side and they will uh, show different sides of it. Uh, there are people who use the Kabbalistic tree of life. You know, you're familiar with the 10 sphero of the, the tree of life. There are people who will do a layout in that form. The Celtic cross is the most common. Um, a friend of mine just published a book uh, which um, has an interesting spread that uh, she learned from an old Welsh wizard. Um, that's quite unusual, but I think has some possibilities. It's called The Fool's Mirror. And it's kind of like the cards are laid out in diagonal form. You lay out 22 cards and you, you only use the major arcana. So every card appears in the spread. It's a question of where it appears and how they relate to each other that tells you what you need to know. Now this has some advantages because um, if you use an ordinary, uh, one of the more familiar layouts, uh, and I, those of you who've read Fortunes um, may have uh, had this experience. Where, you know, you know, you're reading cards for somebody, and then you know, you know, something like Death or the Tower, or you know, some really dark-looking card comes up, and you know, the, the person, you know, the, the, the person you're reading for thinks he's screwed. <laughs> um, and it, 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 and chances are, no matter how you interpret it, the person goes home and says, "Wow, I saw the Death card. That's the only thing they remember." So in this layout, the death card is gonna show up, right? Uh, the tower card is gonna show up, the devil is gonna show up. So it, 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 it becomes kind of part of the, the natural occurrence. Um, the book is called uh, Tarot Triumphs uh, by Cherry Gilchrist, if you want to uh, read it. And I think, I think there's something, to, I think it's very, it also has uh, some description. It starts with a description of the old uh, kind of an, imaginative but, but very plausible description of what the old uh, medieval triumphs looked like, those, those old processions. So um, that's, that's what I would say. But I think you know, most, most tarot readers think the more they do, the more it becomes a you know, question of trial and error. You know, this kind of works for me. Uh, they might do different ones in different circumstances. I had a question from somebody listening through the internet. Do you feel that it's correct to correspond the tarot trump cards alongside Jungian archetypes? Yes. Isn't that enough? I, it'll have to be if that's all you're giving. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, if you look at, if you like wrote a list of Jung's archetypes, just wrote down all of the, the ones he talks about the most. It would be remarkably easy to correlate them to one or another of the tarot trumps. Hey, the trickster, uh, the anima, the animus, uh, the divine, well, that's the hermaphrodite, um, uh, the wise old man, that's the self, the shadow, and on and on. So you, yeah, you can do it. Uh, and I sometimes think that the one purpose of the Tarot Arcana, the major arcana, is to serve as kind of like a uh, concise guide to the archetypes of the Jungian unconscious. So I think that, as I said, the answer is yes. Um, as an aside, um, Jung himself did not write a great deal about the Tarot, um, but he did study it a little bit. He studied it with a group in Zurich around 1950. And the group kind of fell apart after two or three years for, I don't know, whatever reason. 
Um, but uh, they did study it a little bit, and Jung uh, said that this deck, the Tarot of Marseille, of all the ones he looked at, seemed to have the most archetypal content. So you focused on the uh, Marseille deck, mm -hmm. and a friend once told me that it's really hard to find the actual Marseille deck, the variations of the deck. So for example, if you go to Quest, the Quest bookstore, you can buy uh, the Universal uh, Marseille, which is close to this, but not identical. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, where did, did you get these images online, or do you actually have a Marseille deck? Uh, yes, to both. I didn't. Uh, the, the the most common you know, Marseille deck available, and one I think most people use, is published, I believe, by a French company called Grimaud. Uh, and I mean, these are all, as I said, these are all different tarots of Marseille. And you know, you can see they have, uh, you know, like this one is obviously nothing like many of the others. Um, you know, they are different ages. This is. You know, this looks like a little bit more uh, contemporary or maybe 19th century than, you know, some of this, which looks like it's almost out of a, uh, you know, a medieval broadsheet. Um, but the ones published by Grimaud are the ones I think that are most widely available. And it would, you would have to have, to have to be a real specialist, um, I think, to, to really suss out the differences in the different versions of the... Uh, the uh, Tarot of Marseille, although it could be an interesting exercise in its own right. Tarot is fascinating. In fact, um, as an aside, um, it, around 1980, a book was published called The Game of Tarot, and it was a, a description, a collection of all the games that the author could find of the Tarot. Uh, the games played with it, not for cardomancy or divination, just the games that people played with it. Um, this book is out of print and very expensive to get. It was written by Sir Michael Dummett. And the reason he was Sir Michael Dummett is that, not for anything he, having to do with his interest in the Tarot, but the fact that he was one of the most distinguished British philosophers of his generation. It's kind of, you know, kind of a brilliant philosopher and sort of get into this little hobby of studying different games of the Tarot. He actually wrote a couple of other books on the history of the Tarot with a couple of collaborators, so he, he became kind of an expert on it. But um, again, it started out with the Tarot as a game. Sorry, this is a very simple question. I'm new to all this. So um, what I've been seeing is that there's people that say that the car being upside down, it, it impacts its meaning. So what do you think about that? What are your thoughts about it? Um, of course, there are different, a lot of different systems of interpretation. But I would say most of them would say something like this. If a card is reversed in a reading, um, it either means kind of the opposite of its conventional meaning, or it means the same thing kind of muted. Like if some of the really bad cards are reversed, like uh, the Nine of Swords or the Ten of Swords, you know, which, you know, the, the Rider Wait, Wait deck um, look really um, dreadful. You know, they have these black backgrounds, this guy's got ten swords, this dead man has got ten swords stuck in his back. You know, you really think that, wow, that, <laughs> things are going to be great if you get this one. Um, um, you know, and some of those are, you know, well, if, it, if you get that reversed, doesn't necessarily mean good news, it just means that like, uh, I don't know, you, they might not drive the swords in quite as deep or something like that. <laughs> but those are, the usual, those are the usual way they interpret those. Uh. So I don't know if this may be personal, but uh, do you read the tarot for yourself? Uh, I don't. Um, I used to. Um, generally speaking, I have not had good luck with divination, particularly done for myself, doing it for myself, um, because it's just too easy to lie to yourself. To like either the two, the two most likely errors you can fall into are one, you know, have some delusory sense of 
how wonderful it's going to be from the result of this or some equally inaccurate um, feeling of doom about the whole thing. It's, you know, it's, it's like probably like anything. I mean, you know, even a good surgeon would not try to perform an appendectomy on himself. Um, um, it's, and I think, you know, by and large, it's better for oneself to kind of train your own inner intuition. Um, so the external things are not quite as important, although they can be valuable ways of developing intuition. It's, it's not that they're not, but that's, and I haven't read Deck for uh, anyone for a long time. Well, this is just a comment. I, I mean, I don't use them for divination, but I find that when I, they verify me. If I do, if I'm confused about something or I'm just, you know, I don't know. Every once in a while I just think, okay, I just need to see what the cards say about this. And it's, and I'm not, I just started doing this recently, so I have to look up in a book. And there, it's always spot on. And sometimes I don't realize exactly what's going on with me until I read what the meaning of the card is. And then it's, it's just very helpful. Oh, of course, because something's been percolating in my subconscious, but mm -hmm. I didn't get it until I saw it in the cards. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's mm -hmm. not a question of telling the future. It's just verifying where I am now, and it's astonishing to me how accurate they always are. That sounds like a very Thanks. good use um, uh, for it. Um, you know, this is... Uh, the whole purpose behind divination is to have access to some kind of unseen... Things. In the old days, this was considered spirits, the spirits, and you know, if, if you did like, if uh, you did it, like Ifa, which is a, a, a traditional West African form of divination where they throw cowrie shells, they definitely look at it as, you know, what the spirits have to say about the matter. People today are, are, are get kind of uncomfortable, you know, thinking about spirits and, um, you know, a, a, I don't know, it gets too exorcist-like for them or too soon or something like that. And so they don't, they, they tend to think of it as accessing their own subconscious. But they both may be ways of looking at the same thing. The other point to make about that is one advantage of the way you're doing it is it uh, evades one problem that you can have with access to intuition um, or your subconscious, which is the subconscious is easily bored and if it's bored and it's uninterested, it's not going to give you good results. Um, that's why, I don't know, I, I myself think for most people the more laborious methods of divination, you know, probably aren't likely to work as well. Maybe for a, a real, you know, like an old traditional Chinese master, the I Ching, it might work, but uh, it might not work so great for you because the unconscious gets bored. I have this little app on my phone. Um, uh, it's kind of a, it's called e an ESP Trainer. Uh, it was it was invented by Russell Targ, a parapsychologist who spoke here uh, two or three years ago. As some of you may remember him. And what you do is it has like four little squares, uh, color squares, um, and you guess which one is the right one. Red, yellow, you know. And if it um, you're wrong, it gives you kind of a, a buzzing noise. It gives you, if it's a right, it gives you kind of a pleasant ring and shows you a lovely picture of a castle in Italy or something. I notice myself when I, I don't play with this that much, but I do notice that the first couple of times I, I try it um, are times I'm most likely to succeed. And even if you do it like four or five times, I, I can sense the unconscious getting bored with it and you know the um, average goes back to random. So. Avoiding boring your unconscious is probably a good way to um, uh, practice divination.